What led you to study kids and discipline? I think socialization and discipline are complementary to basic developmental trends and so it's a natural to get a full picture of human development to take into account socialization in general, parenting in particular, parental discipline techniques more specific than that. Can you tell me a little bit about why you were studying, what you were studying in your latest body of research? Well, I think a lot of our uh, work derives from a very important literature review that someone named Martin Hoffman did. Uh, and Hoffman introduced uh, really the typology of parental discipline that we still use today. Um, and it was, but there were some issues pertaining to his typology um, and I wanted to explore those, those particular questions, research questions. Um, one hypothesis uh, was never really, there was never, Hoffman didn't really provide um, uh, substantial evidence for a key part of his socialization theory, which was that the, the reason that inductive, what he called inductive discipline, or pointing out to the child uh, how his or her uh, transgression has, has impacted others, um, that it, 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 the link between that and pro-social behavior is attributable to the cultivation of empathy for others in the child. Uh, so one of my students, Julia Krebins, many years ago, got interested in that, and that was our, our first um, foray into this field of moral socialization. You yeah. use the term inductive discipline yeah. and also pro-social behavior. Yeah. Can you explain what, what each of, of those are? Hoffman started to call it other-oriented induction after a while to emphasize this notion that you're trying to induce in the child an awareness of how the transgression, or whatever it was, uh, had adversely impacted uh, uh, others. So you may say, um, don't yell at him, he was only trying to help, for example. Um, and the association line with longitudinal studies is that that kind of discipline technique is associated with subsequent pro-social behavior, meaning um, maybe reparative behavior um, to try to um, make it up to the child that has been hurt uh, by your child. Um, other things that um, the child may do um, to just generally have a more positive than harmful impact upon others. There's also a term perceived acceptance. Are these parental behaviors, do they, and do they work at odds, or do they go hand in hand? Well, one important point about that is that uh, in any discipline encounter, uh, including induction, it's very important that there be a backdrop of perceived acceptance, uh, that the child perceives the parent, mother or father, as uh, someone who cares about them, uh, has expressed warmth, nurturance, support, concern, uh, so that then when the, the uh, parent has to discipline the child, the child cares about what the parent is saying and um, wants to make sure that their behavior in the future doesn't jeopardize this caring, nurturing relationship. So perceived acceptance, I think, um, fits in that way in relation to discipline. You want, it, you want a, a foundation or a backdrop of uh, of, of a caring relationship between the parent and the child. Tell me a little bit about your most recent study, how many kids you looked at, over what period of time, and mm -hmm. how you conducted that research. Really, my research has always been through my graduate students. And I think I mentioned Julia Kravins uh, back in the 90s. Um, and she had a, her study, I think, involved about 80 children of 7th and 8th graders, 6th and 7th graders. and. Um, with their parents. Uh, and then more recently, uh, uh, Renee Patrick, who was at the uh, University of Tampa, uh, did some similar studies following up from what uh, Julia had done. And I think, in fact, I think um, Renee is the one who mentioned, who, who got especially interested in the importance of perceived acceptance as, you know, a, as, a, as a crucial foundation. What age group was she looking at? Do you know how many um, children she studied and over what period of time? Uh, I think she had a somewhat broader age range. It was like from fifth through eleventh grade as I recall and involved several hundred students, mainly middle class. When parents think of discipline, mm -hmm. the common thought is you got to start early. So most mm -hmm. parents are really focused on those early years. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, is that the most important time to, or does discipline evolve. And I think discipline and the, what's appropriate with discipline does evolve, partly because the child is developing. Um, 
I mentioned something like don't yell at him who's only trying to help as, as an example that would be um, you know appropriate for younger you know years especially maybe um, you may for a younger child say uh, you know she's he's pushed she's pushed down and she's crying because you you, you pushed her and that's not nice or something like that um, uh, but then when the child as the child's cognitive development um, matures then you can start to use more um, subtle uh, and intangible kinds of appeals um, and especially in those middle school years that, that you mentioned um, you can start to make appeals to uh, disappointment in the child uh, because the child is starting to develop uh, uh, more of a self-concept, more of a reflection about the kind of person they are and want to be or aspire to be uh, and you can use that. You can um, appeal to the, the, your, your faith in the child and your awareness that uh, the child is capable of better behavior. Could you give me some examples of, of phrases that parents use to, to demonstrate that they're disappointed? A uh, parent might say something like, <clears throat> I never expected that kind of behavior from you, uh, or I have faith in you, I know you can do better than that. Uh, I'm going to expect um, better behavior uh, the next time, and I'm going to look forward to better behavior the next time, and so on. So, yeah, to be positive, to not jeopardize that perceived acceptance that we talked about, um, but also make clear that you know, you're disappointed, you know that the child you know, can do better and um, can be a more considerate person. And what's interesting is sometimes then, subsequently, as the child reflects on that, they think, you know, not only did I let mom down or dad down, but I kind of let myself down. And then a, a, a sense of a more moral identity starts to develop. And that was something that Renee Patrick was especially interested in, and, and her research really uh, established that link, too. How much better from your research does this kind of parenting behavior work than what my parents and grandparents would call the old-fashioned punitive methods? Well, of course, under no circumstances is child abuse uh, acceptable. But, you know, I, I don't know if you remember a show called Super Nanny uh, that was around for a while. And Joe Frost was Super Nanny. And the, I remember one particular episode, and I use it actually an excerpt uh, f from this in my class, where um, the mother is contending with some very self-centered teenagers. And um, uh, Frost, Joe Frost suggested that she take the children to uh, a homeless shelter so that they can understand that not everyone is as fortunate as, as they have been. Uh, but one of the girls, they're both pre-adolescents, uh, really refuses to participate. And um, Joe Frost comes to her and says, I expect better behavior from you. And we are here at this ho homeless shelter because there are people who are, uh, have been less fortunate than you, you know, and so on. And I'm going to give you two minutes to think about that, and then I expect you to come and join us. And it works. <laughs> it worked, fortunately. Uh, but well, I was impressed with that because it's not that induction has to be given in some kind of namby pamby way. Um, you you don't have to be a milk toast. You need to, and Hoffman makes this point too. You have to make sure that the child is taking you seriously, and you're getting the child's attention. Um, and because otherwise, it's just going to roll off the duck's back, and it's not going to be helpful. What were the findings? Well, I think we've alluded to uh, some of her key findings, um, uh, one pertaining to this concept, which is big in the literature right now, moral identity, and uh, how, especially in those middle school years, using uh, inductive, inductive discipline in general, and, and especially parental expression of disappointed expectations in the child, uh, is linked to not only greater empathy for others in the child, uh, and more pro-social behavior, but also more of a sense of oneself as someone who aspires to be a moral person, an integration of moral qualities with self-concept. Um, and I think that was a very important finding. She also, um, we talk, you mentioned perceived acceptance, and, and uh, Renee has, has looked at that too. And that gets back to that point about the, the, the foundational relationship between parent and child. So important that the child feels accepted, loved, nurtured, cared for, believed in, you know. And, and then when the induction comes along, it can have an impact in a favorable way. What are um, some implications from, from this research? 
every parent wants their child to be a, you know, to, to grow up to be a, a responsible, moral person who is aspiring to make the world a better place. And I think that's the ultimate implication of this is here's a means by which you can um, uh, promote the prospect of th that kind of child outcome. Uh, and it doesn't mean that you can't use some power assertion. We talked about that in, in a bit. Um, the child definitely has to take the message seriously. Um, but you don't do that to the extent that the child becomes intimidated or, or, or fearful of the relationship um, or just oriented to how they can um, escape consequences or, or uh, you want the, the induction to make sure that the child recognizes what the heart of the matter is, which is how the child's behavior, whatever it happens to have been, uh, has adversely impacted uh, others and what they can do about that and how they can aspire to be you know, a better person that you know they can be. For parents who haven't thought about discipline this mm -hmm. way, can you give me three examples of ways that they can start mm -hmm. the conversation or they can lay down the law mm -hmm. in a way that, that is positive? They may say something like, um, uh, I wouldn't have expected that because I know the kind of person you are and I think, I think more highly of you uh, than I do of what you've done. Uh, and I know you can do better, and I'm going to look forward to you doing better in the future. Uh, that kind of thing. Positive, but still recognizing that there's, there's a disappointment there. And if the child cares about the relationship to the parent, that's going to make a, uh, an impact. And, and, and that's the notion about that, plus just cultivating general empathy in the child. Those are the mechanisms that we think mediate this connection between inductive discipline and subsequent pro-social behavior in the child. Is there anything I didn't ask you, Dr. Gibbs, that you would want to make sure that people know about your research? Well, the, the biggest picture is that um, there's moral socialization is important. Um, there's also moral development taking place, which is distinguishable from moral socialization. Um, and the two really need to work in tandem, I think. And I go into this, and to put it in a plug for my book, I go into this in my book, Moral Development and Reality. Can you tell me what's the difference between the two? Moral development, I think, has a cognitive core, meaning that um, the child is growing beyond superficial ways of understanding the world and themselves. Um, and you can see this in non-social realms as, as well as social realms. Um, moral socialization has to do with what we've been talking about, these techniques. Uh, how do you discipline a child? Uh, what, is, what is good parenting? Uh, people have talked about you know, author, authoritative as better than authoritarian parenting, for example. Um, and, and that's very important, but socialization often is taken to just mean how a child comes to be socialized into his or her particular culture or society. Um, and that has a relativistic kind of um, aspect to it. Uh, and so that's why I think it's especially important to recognize that a good moral socialization has to work in tandem with basic um, trends, age-related trends that we've identified in moral and, and cognitive development. If you don't do that, then who's to say that someone socialized as a good you know, Nazi youth uh, isn't uh, being moral insofar as they've been enculturated fully into their particular you know, societal context. Anyway, so I guess that would be the broadest point I'd want to make. Just a little bit about your background, where you've yeah. got your undergraduate work, your master's. Mm -hmm. I was at Princeton uh, back in the 60s uh, and um, was fascinated by this um, stage theory of moral development by someone named Lawrence Kohlberg. And I subsequently was very fortunate at, at Harvard to work with Kohlberg and actually be on the research faculty there for a while after getting my degree. And, um, and then fortunate again to transition from Harvard to Ohio State, where I've been since 1979.